just be honest with you, I was looking for my glasses. As Mike was finishing up, and I'm like, they're on my face, okay. So I found them, so I don't know how good it's going to go tonight, but started off a little rough for me back there trying to find my glasses. Um, tonight's lesson, or tonight's sermon is, we're going to take a little walk through the trees of the Bible. Um, and honestly, this wasn't the sermon I was going to do tonight. I was going to do a really fire and brimstone, why should we care sermon. And I was driving, I, t I think I said this in Bible class for those that weren't here this morning. And I looked across that field with the frost on the ground and the trees and how beautiful it was. And I'm thinking to myself, look at God's glory just shining brightly there. So I'm sitting there and I'm getting ready to, to start writing this sermon. And I look over and, and Carolyn, who is much more organized than me and keeps me organized, has all these nice sermons in these things that have happened. And I pick up a folder that has a bunch of sermons from Jim Mowder. And I'm just going through them, looking at them and stuff, and all at once, this sermon jumped out at me. And I said, you know, this is what I'm going to, to speak on on Sunday night, it's the trees. Here in Ohio, we're getting close to the end of the fall foliage, as they call it, the peak season for the trees. Some one of the most beautiful times of the year. Um, besides spring, when, it's, when the trees start coming out, we're now going in again to our second mud season and raking leaves and everything else, which isn't so much fun. But we get to see these beautiful trees, the beautiful leaves. I love looking at the red and the yellow and the oranges, how beautiful those are. Um, it took me back to when I was in high school and we had to do a project on different leaves and different trees. And we had to go out, and luckily for me, I lived in the middle of a forest, so it only took me 15 minutes to find 12 different trees just like that. Pulled them in, put them in a book, wrote down what they were and everything. But have you ever picked the leaf up and just looked at it for just a second? It's probably been a long time since you've really studied the leaf to know how intricate, how well it's designed, the beauty of it, the way that some leaves are shaped differently. Have you ever heard of a tatabi tree? We had one of those. A what? A tatabi tree, yes. I don't know if that's the official name. That's what my mom and dad called it, so that's what I'm going with. <laughs> but it had these big, gigantic leaves that hung on them, and they were just so beautiful when they fell. I mean, they would fall, and it, it just was awful. We often built lots of things with them and did things you know, we didn't have much to do out in the middle of nowhere, so leaves were fun. And then I learned to not like leaves so much when I was squirrel hunting, because they make a lot of noise, and you gotta be quiet. But now, living in the city, I love the trees, I love the leaves, and I have a rider that I just mow them and mulch them and I don't have to rake them, so I'm good. Yes. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. But I say all this to say this, the trees of the Bible are also something to study, to learn from, and to behold. They're not necessarily the lesson for tonight, but there's five different trees that I want to look at in the Bible tonight, and they all come into playing a larger part in different scenes or different times of the Bible of where things happen at. So let us look at these five trees of the Bible. We're going to start out in Genesis 3, 1 through 6. I'm sorry, the scripture reading for tonight comes from Revelations 22, 1 through 3. Let me read that first. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street and in either side of the river was the tree of life which bore twelve fruits, each fruit yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Now if we want to go over to Genesis 3. 
1 through 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than the, any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that it, in this day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. We're talking about the tree of knowledge here. That tree is pretty important, isn't it? When you think about what happened. That tree right there unleashed sin upon the world. Tree. Unleashed sin upon the world. Think about it for just a second. We know that Eve took it and ate the fruit from it. God put that tree there for a reason, didn't he? We're going to look back here later on in the, in the thing and, and look at trees that God made when he created the earth. But by eating of the fruit of that tree, Adam and Eve knew good and evil. Now, today, if someone come up to you, eat this fruit, you will know this and this. I hope we know better than to eat the fruit. Because they unleashed that. A tree forbidden to take of its fruit uh, it was a simple one request by God. Don't touch it. Don't eat of it. Don't do anything. But they did. And it unleashed Satan throughout the world. Now, let's bring that back to us. What have we done to unleash Satan in the world? What have we done to not take Jesus and put him first. Because if you're not putting Jesus first, you might as well be eating of that tree of the garden. Because there's only two rulers of this. We either fall under God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit or we fall under Satan. So we're either one way or the other. We've talked about this many times. There is no fence. But think about that tree and the significance that it had. Now here's a tree that very seldom do we ever think about when we look at this because it, it's, just, it's just kind of there, but it's mentioned quite a bit in John 1, 43 through 51. John 1, 43 through 51. Now during the day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, and the city of Andrew and Peter. The city of Andrew and Peter. Peter found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law, and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth. Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said to him, Behold the Israelite, indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, you were under a fig tree. I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, him, answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree, do you believe? You will, be, you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Wow. 
Now think about that. You're Nathaniel. You're resting under, this doesn't say what he's doing under the fig tree. He could have been reading, studying, taking a nap. I don't know what he was doing, but all of a sudden you're under a fig tree minding your own business. And your brother comes to you and said, come, I have found the Messiah. And you're like, get out of here. I'm serious. Really? Nah. He says, no, come. And as you are approaching Jesus, he says, you Nathaniel who was under a fig tree. Now right there, Nathaniel's whole mind has to go in reverse. You know, if you're driving down the interstate going 85 and you put the car in reverse, you know what happens? It had to blow his mind. How did he know I was under a fig tree? He has to be the Messiah. Well, Jesus said, just because I knew he was under a fig tree means nothing. That means nothing. Verse 51 is an amazing verse. And he said to him, most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You go from sitting under a fig tree to see the heavens opening in just a few short verses. Wow. I'd love to be Nathaniel. I really would. I'd love to be sitting under the tree and someone said, come follow me, and then all of a sudden I see the heavens open and the angels ascending and descending upon Jesus. What a beautiful thought. The Messiah opened his eyes to much greater things than he could ever imagine. You know, I know when I sat under a tree, when I used to fish, I would find a tree and sit under it, throw my line in the water, and take a snooze. I used to love to sit under trees, shady, cool, and go to sleep. I kind of picture Nathaniel going that. So you go from that to seeing the heavens open because you were under a fig tree and you believe that because Jesus said that to you. How does a fig tree relate to heaven? That's how. That's how. Now Luke 19.10 Charles has a song for it, but he doesn't know it all. I'd let him sing it. Ryan started singing it today at lunch, too, when we went there. I remember one line, and I'm not a singer, so I'm not going to sing it. But we're going to let Luke 19, 1 through 10. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was the chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see, see who Jesus was, but could not because he was in the crowd, for he was a short, of short statue. So he ran ahead and climbed up to a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. All right. I gotta stop there for a second. You're Zacchaeus, a tax collector, the low of the low for people at that time. And you're not only a tax collector, you're a man of very short stature. Now let's look at that culture. I believe the average height was around my height, about five, six, five, seven. So he was shorter than that. He climbed up a sycamore tree climbed out so that he could see Jesus pass. He just wanted to see him pass. He had no idea. But he, Jesus is walking, stops, looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down. Now I would have fell out of the tree. I would have fell out of the tree really fast and really hard. But he's in a sycamore tree. And we go on here. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. I think he fell, honestly be honest with you like I said but when he saw it they all but when they saw it they all complained he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord 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 I give half of all my goods to the poor and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation I restore it full four fourfold and Jesus said to him today salvation has come to this house 
Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Can you imagine that? You're Zacchaeus in a sycamore tree, and you take, and Jesus calls you, and you go to Jesus, and he takes you to his house, and he explains exactly who he is. He is the man that has come to seek and save the lost. Now we start out just a few verses ago, Zacchaeus was looking, trying to figure out who Jesus was. Jesus made it perfectly clear to him. Now, why would he pick a tax collector? Why would he pick Zacchaeus? Why would Zacchaeus climb a sycamore tree? Those are all things for us to think about, but the thing that I come back to is the last verse. That's the people Jesus was seeking to save was the ones that were lost. I don't think Jesus would have stopped for a Pharisee in the tree. Number one, I don't think a Pharisee would have climbed a tree to see Jesus. But I don't think so. But he did. So being in a sycamore tree allowed not only Zacchaeus to see what was going on, but also allows us to see that Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. It doesn't matter what status you have in life. It doesn't matter who you are. Jesus is here to save you. He came to save <coughs> everyone. It's up to those people to respond to that. He's there for everyone. And that's the tough thing that sometimes we have to wrap our minds around. It's hard for me to wrap my minds around Jeffrey Dahmer. I have a hard time doing that as a human being. But as far as I know, he was saved in prison. And that is the forgiveness that we all must have. We must be seeking and bringing the gospel to the lost. Amen. And anyone that does is not baptized and does not know, they're lost. And it's our responsibility. We need to be climbing that sycamore tree and looking for people. We really do. Now here is a tree that I want to look at Luke 23. This is a tree that I call the unknown type of tree. When I looked this up, just to make sure I was right, a lot of people say it was a dogwood tree, the experts do. Now I, not, I don't know, because the Bible doesn't say what kind of tree it is, but it was a tree. Let's look at 26 through 49. It's a long reading, but I think we need it all. Now as he led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Syrian, Cyrenian, Cyrenian, who was coming from the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of people followed him, and the women who was mourning and laminated him. But Jesus, turning them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and breasts which never nursed. Then they shall begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood and will be done, in the dry. There was also two other criminals led with him to be put to the death. And when they had come to the place they called Calvary, they were crucified, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they did. And they delivered him, and they divided his garments and cast lots. <clears throat> And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him, let him save himself, for he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And the inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. 
Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. <clears throat> but the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Do not even fear do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be, in, you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was the dark over all the earth until the ninth hour then the sun was then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice he said father into your hands I commit my spirit having said this he breathed his last so when the centurion saw that had happened he glorified God saying certainly this was a righteous man and the whole crowd who came together in that sight, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all of his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. I named this the tree of the unknown tree. Jesus was crucified on a tree. That tree, to me, was the very most important tree ever created on earth because it held our salvation, our Savior, our King, our High Priest, the Alpha and the Omega. I can go through all those names I did a long time ago. But more importantly, it took our sins. That tree took our sins. There is no other tree that I can think as important as what that tree was the unknown tree that held Jesus at that time. We look often, you go and you see around, you see these three crosses at different places around. You see them grouped together. Some are painted, some aren't painted. They're all empty. But just think, what one time for you and me and the world, Jesus hung on that tree to save us. It's something we can't ever forget. What a wonderful, wonderful tree that had to be. Now there's one more tree I want to talk about. It is in Genesis 2.9. We're going to start out there. And I, I, there, I almost use this as a, my verse, but I didn't want to. But this is a beautiful verse here about trees. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant in sight and good for food. Isn't that a beautiful thing to say about a tree? It is. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. We've talked about the good and evil and we've kind of talked about the other tree. But I want to talk now about the tree of life. The tree of life. So we're going to jump up to Revelations 2 7. Revelations 2 7. And it says, Brethren, I write no commandment to you but an old commandment which you have been from the beginning. An old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. And I wanted to go to 2 9. And he says he is the light and hates his brother is the darkness until now. And why am I in John? And you guys didn't correct me. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Didn't know what translation. Correct me. 2 9. I know your works, tribulations, and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. But but you are of the synagogue. And that is 2 9. You want 2 7. 2 7 is what I want. He is, has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to you eat from the tree of life, which is amidst of the paradise of God. You know, 
I went over and over my sermon. I messed that up every time. Just want you to know, that was not done on purpose. It's how I train myself for this lesson. I am consistent. Revelations 22 through 14. Revelations 22, verse 2 says, In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And then verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, and they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. The tree of life gives us eternal salvation with God. I can't wait to go to heaven, as John describes it here, to see that river like, like that, to see that tree of life, and to hear, and just to look at its beauty. It's got to be the most beautiful tree ever. It has to be. Now, we went on vacation, and we went to Charleston, and we went out and we seen what they call the angel tree. What was it called? Tell me, I forget. Angel oak. E angel oak tree. I forgot the oak. But it was important. This tree, I'm thinking, why are we going out to look at a tree? I'm thinking, I've seen enough trees in my lifetime. I don't, I don't need to drive an hour and a half to go see a tree. But Wayne and Nancy considered that we needed to see that tree. So I, I, they were driving, so I was going wherever they went. So we went there and we seen this tree. And I want to tell you, it is probably the most magnificent tree I've ever seen in my life. This tree was huge. It had limbs that, you know, just, you could, it was so beautiful. So, so beautiful. And we spent quite a bit of time there looking at the tree, walking around the tree, and doing everything. It was so wonderful to get to that tree. Now, the most beautiful part of it was that we were with our fellow brothers and sisters and friends, and we got to enjoy it with them. But that tree was amazing. But I know it has no comparison to the tree of life. And I can't wait to be standing in heaven on that shore with that crystal water looking at that tree. Who knows, I might spend 3,000 years in heaven just looking at that tree. It could happen. It really could. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed this short walk through the trees then and then the book. There's so many other trees in there too, but I, I chose those five. It's amazing how you can go from a sycamore tree to understanding why Jesus came to this earth. How you can just be sitting under a fig tree one minute and seeing angels ascending and descending the next moment. How you yourself can unleash sin upon the world. And then the unknown tree that held our salvation. That held our salvation. He's no longer there. But he, a tree held him. And then at the very end, we get to see the tree of life when this life is over with. Oh, I'm excited to see that. John explains heaven in such a wonderful way. Because he saw heaven, didn't he? And he put it into earthly terms. Man, a river like crystal clear. I don't know if we have that anymore in our lives. A crystal clear river like that. And to see that tree. Tonight I ask you this question. Have you allowed Jesus to come into your life? Are you ready to accept Jesus if he hasn't? And if you've done anything at all that has made any separation in your life from Jesus, don't take that chance because I want every one of us to see that tree of life. And I want us all to enjoy it for eternity. I know there's no time in heaven but boy, I'm going to study that tree. It's going to be beautiful. If you have any need at all, come as we stand and sing.